All right, good morning, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started with our Sunday school hour this morning. Actually, uh, just our Sunday school a few minutes, and uh, bear with us with this uh, microphone as we get it adjusted with people in the room now. Uh, thank you all for coming out this morning. Listen, I know that sometimes change is difficult, change may be hard, but uh, sometimes change is good, and uh, I, I believe that that's what's going to happen here today is the changes that you've seen take place over the last few weeks is, is all starting today. And uh, this is when change is rallied around the Word of God and His people, uh, it's always a good change. So there may be things that look a little different, sound a little different, feel a little different, but don't be alarmed by that. Uh, just be gracious with us. That's all we ask that you help us as we go through this transition together. We are looking forward to uh, this hour in particular is we are going to be spending uh, 13 or 14 weeks going through our statement of faith, so we are all kind of clear. This is going to be simply each week you're going to get a, a flyover or the 30,000 foot view, so to speak, of each statement of faith. And, and how many of you have your packet that you were handed at the door? Everybody got one? Does anybody not have one? Chuck's boy doesn't have one. Hey, Nathan, can you bring one of those to uh, little Chuck up here? If you haven't seen Chuck and Tate together this morning, they are wearing almost the same clothes, so it's, it's a little too much. Just kidding. <laughs> I don't know, maybe for Amanda. I don't know, two, looking at two Chucks, a big Chuck and a baby Chuck. <laughs> He's got, no, I think they're, they're supposed to be two pages, or four pages, two pages front and back. Okay, I got you. So if you'll notice, too, we'll have our, our, our youth, our students are in here with us going through this. They're all sitting together right here. That's awesome. And uh, we've got, what grade are you going into? Seventh? Awesome. She's sitting by mom and dad. That's cool, though. We like it. Uh, so y'all make them feel welcome this morning as they're in here going through the statement of faith with us. And we got some that have moved up right here that are uh, in here for the first time with the students. So that's a, a good thing. And our kids obviously are back there uh, going through their things. <clears throat> so this morning, uh, just again, bear with us as we go through these changes and as we study the Word of God together, study our statement of faith. And what you'll see over the next 13 weeks is you'll see different men standing here teaching uh, through our statement of faith. So we're pretty excited about that. Men that are, are teach, teaching in our church already and some that haven't as much. So uh, I'm excited to see uh, these men get up here after me. I think I only have one other week after this. And uh, so I was given the word of God. So let's pray this morning and then we'll jump right into this. Father, thank you so much for this time you've given us together. We thank you that we can gather in here and, and just go through our statement of faith, which what we're talking about this morning comes solely from the Word of God. Father, we're thankful for your Word. We're thankful that it is true, and we are thankful that uh, it's our final authority, especially in this church. Father, be with us now as we uh, teach through this, and we ask you these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so if you got your statement of faith here, I've got them labeled off in sections here, but yours probably isn't because mine is handwritten. Uh, the first section we see here this morning it's called the Word of God. Now, here's the next few things that we're going to talk through or what we believe is where we stand as a church. So first and foremost here, it says, We believe and teach that the sole and final authority for the church is the Bible, which includes all 66 books of the Old and New Testament. So this is a, a very big statement right out, of the, right out of the gate because this is something that we need to stand on here as a church. Is, uh, I have a book right here. And I'm going to give this away to somebody today that loves to read. So each week we're hoping to give away a book uh, to someone for further study. So I see some of you licking your lips and like, I want that book already. So uh, I don't know how we're going to give it away, but we're going to give it away. So uh, each week we we'll hope to do that. But listen, we don't get the final authority from a book. Right, this book right here that I'm going to give away is a great book about Scripture and its final authority and it tells all about the Word of God. But we can't live and die on this book right here. We can't live and die on our statement of faith, 
right? We can't, th- these are good guidelines. And listen, you have many scripture references all throughout this. And those are good because that's our final authority, right? And then that's not even all of the scripture references. Those are just a few scripture references in there. So when it comes to your life, as well as the church life, final authority, what trumps everything should be the Word of God. And that's where we align this morning, as this church's leadership aligns, is uh, it, it's good to know that the church leadership is going to the Word to make decisions. So some of you may be saying, well, how did you make the decision to go to one unified service? We just went to the Word of God and started praying through it, started looking at the early church and how everybody was gathered together and had everything in common and were just living amongst each other as unified people. So we even went to the Word of God to do what we're doing this morning because the Bible is the sole and final authority of the church. Now, there's three scripture references here, but I want to point out the first two and I'll read them. Romans 15, 4 says, For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. Now again, I will go back to the book on my podium up here. I'll go back to our statement of faith. Some of these things will give us a little hope maybe, but when it comes to our utmost and supreme hope, it comes from the Word of God. So I want to encourage you, if you don't read the Word of God, if you don't study the Word of God, I want to encourage you to do so. Because it's there where we'll find hope. We'll find true hope through the Scriptures. And Hebrews 1 1 and 2 says, Long ago at many times and in many ways God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed to the heir of all things, through whom also He created the world. Now, This is another statement that we can lean on and have hope in is that we don't need any other outside source. We don't need any new prophecies for today. We don't need any new special revelations or anything like that because everything that we need to know, everything that God has for us from now until he comes back is contained in these 66 books. There's 39 uh, books in the Old Testament and 27 in the New Testament. There's different genres of the Bible where you'll have history, poetry, prophecy, uh, the epistles, the gospels, all of these things you can find throughout the scriptures. And we believe that this is God's word, the final authority within the church. And that should be an encouragement to you this morning. Let me tell you why that should be an encouragement to you. I've already said it once, but I'll say it again because it's worth repeating, is that as your pastor and as other men in this church, leaders, they're not making decisions based off emotion. They're not making decisions based off what they think or what the latest church guru website says of how to grow your church or how to have an awesome church or how to have your best life now, right? We are going to the Word of God and letting the Word of God uh, teach us and lead us of how we should lead and carefully lead God's church because at the end of the day, this is not ours. I tell you this all the time. This belongs to the Lord. The Bible teaches that He is the head of of the church. He reigns supreme. We'll talk about that in our 10 o'clock hour this morning in our sermon. But uh, that should be an incredible encouragement because many people in many churches all across the world, they're Googling things. They're going to the Google machine and they're saying how to grow your church, how to have a good church service, how to all these things. And we already have a how to and he's given it to us through his word. So that's why we need to hold the Word of God with utmost priority. Because it is here that we learn, that we understand, that we are allowed to let the Lord lead us as we make decisions. And this is not just in the church life. This should be in your life as well, in your own personal life. Because listen, I'm going to be honest with you this morning. If you're just taking your Bible and you're closing it up after Sunday and it's sitting still until the next Sunday, that is not good. Every day... And there's going to be days that you don't feel like it. There's going to be days that you're going to be, man, I don't, the Bible, I just don't have time. We need to make time for the Word of God. And not just read it, because here's what I would do. Here's what we have to be careful about doing, is just reading it for reading's sake, to say I read my Bible today, I did my Bible intake. We need to study the Scriptures. Because Scripture interprets Scripture, which then interprets more Scripture. So it all interprets itself. And it teaches us, it's profitable for us. It's God's Word right here in the 66 books. So please, 
let the scriptures be your final authority as well. And if you aren't reading and studying the word, I, I encourage you to do so. Our second here says, we believe and teach that every word of the original autographs is God breathed. Therefore, the scriptures are verbally inspired, inerrant, infallible, totally sufficient and trustworthy for doctrine and instruction. And I just want to read a couple of these verses here. We're not going to read all of them, but if you look uh, almost half, a little over halfway down in your scripture references to Isaiah 55, 10 through 11, it says, For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. And that is a comforting statement this morning as we know that this is God's word and it's going to go forth and do what he wants it to do. Now, unfortunately, and I hope you're going to stick around and pay attention in the second service or the 10 o'clock service, because many people for many years have taken the word of God and manipulated it and perverted it to make it fit their own agenda, to make it fit something that is not really right. So they'll take what's true and they'll manipulate it to make it become false. And then when it does that, that it takes away what God means. It takes away the trustworthiness of it. That's why it is important extremely important that you test everything that you hear. Everything that somebody says, whether you see this, whether you see somebody on TV, whether you hear me preaching up here, go to the Word of God and study it to make sure that what I'm telling you is accurate, that it's truthful, that it is indeed the Word of God. Because many men have manipulated the Bible to make it fit their agenda and not God's. But God... His word shall not return to me empty, it says. It's going to go out and do what he wants it to do. 2 Timothy 3.16 says this, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Again, I mentioned it just a few minutes ago. These are the very words of God. And then we, if we look back at this heading, it says that the, uh, the Bible is inerrant, infallible, sufficient, and trustworthy for doctrine and instruction. instruction excuse me. So the, this word inerrant means it's incapable of being wrong. So I know you, you can go to Google, you can watch YouTube videos, and there's going to be somebody on there that tries to contradict the Word of God and show where it contradicts itself somewhere. But listen, that is simply not true. The Word of God never contradicts itself. It's incapable of being wrong. That's why we call it God's truth, right? This is not just God's assumptions or God's thoughts or God's uh, roadmap to life, although it could be used that way, but this is God's truth, and everything in it is true, and it is incapable of being wrong. To say that God could write something wrong would be to say that God himself is false, now, how many of us believe that God is a false God, that God of the Bible is a false God? None of us in here would dare say that our God is a false God. So we have to understand and know that there is, uh, this is incapable of being wrong because God's word is truth. This word infallible means that it's accurate. It's error free. There's no mistakes within it. This is a simple way to say that it's error free. You can read it and there are no mistakes there's nothing that's going to contradict itself. There's nothing that's going to be false. It's all going to be what God said and what He meant. That is another big thing when we read Scripture. And we'll talk about that in a minute. The Bible is sufficient. It means that simply that the Bible is enough. That's why it's our final authority. We don't even have to read other books. We don't even have to read articles. We don't even have to do other these things because we have what we have. And it's enough and it's the Word of God. We don't have to go outside of this. Now, good books that understand that, like the one I'm going to give away this morning, they're good for our teaching and for us to learn more and to, to help us dive deeper. But at the end of the day, this is this man's thoughts. And although I trust these resources that you'll see at the end of their handout this morning, I still want to bring everything back to the Bible because it is enough. And again, even when you read books, you can get a hold of some of the rankest heresy that almost sounds good, 
But if you're not aligning it with the Word of God, then you'll just believe something false. That's why it's extremely important to bring everything back to the Bible. Every movie you watch that says it's a Christian movie or a faith-based film, watch it through the lens of Scripture. Watch it through the lens of Scripture, not through the lens of the director or whoever is producing this movie, but bring everything back to the Word of God, for it has the final authority. We also say here that the Bible is trustworthy, meaning it is reliable, that you can depend on it, that everything you read in it, everything you see in it, everything you study is good and profitable for you. That you can't find anything that is going to be unreliable. Kind of like a shade tree mechanic, right? Sometimes they're the best, sometimes they're exactly what they are. You take your car there and you think they're going to fix it and then it's just not, they're not a reliable person to take your car back to. Anybody ever had that problem? Don't take them to this guy <laughs> because they're not reliable. Some of you have vehicles that are not really reliable. We've had them. I got one now. My wife does this. Sometimes we're like, okay, let's get in it. Let's depend on it and thank the Lord it gets us where we need to go. But sometimes we can think, man, I need something, right? Something dependable. And we'll reach out to somebody else. We have dependable friends, reliable friends. You will never go to this word and be let down. I tell you what you will do. You'll go to this word and you'll be like, oh, it is, it is exposing my sin. It's convicting me of an area of sin in my life. It will hurt you sometimes, but it will hurt you in a good way. Especially for your sanctification. So the Bible is trustworthy. It says that it's trust, it is inerrant, infallible, totally sufficient, and trustworthy for doctrine and instruction. Now this is a very important part as well as I was thinking through this is that when we talk about doctrine, and I mean, some of the um, most essential doctrines are the doctrine of God, creation, man, sin, salvation, just major doctrines, minor doctrines, everything that we find in Scripture, your doctrine should be shaped by the Word. I feel like we say this a lot over and over, that we don't take other man's word for it. We don't go to Google. We don't go to YouTube. But whenever we see the doctrine of God or man or sin or salvation or all these things, the Word of God should shape that doctrine within us. And every time we say, well, here is what I believe about God, we should be able to go straight back to His Word. Here's what I believe about the fall of man, and here's why. Here's what the Word says. Now, I know that there are differing opinions and differing uh, areas where we fall when it comes to doctrine and theology. But here's where I want to challenge you to be careful this morning. Is that God, when He wrote His words, He didn't write, a, write these for us to interpret what we think it means. Now that's a, a very difficult thing for some of us to understand because I was growing up learning try to understand and read the Bible and I was like well I think it means this and that is one of the most dangerous things you can ever say when you're reading the word is this is what it means to me or and then you get somebody else in a Bible study group and says well I think it means this or well I, this is what it said to me one of the dangerous things is interpreting the Bible through your own mind and thoughts and emotions because we can all manipulate the Bible to make it fit what we want, right? But the thing is, when God wrote this, God didn't just write this for us to manipulate. When He wrote it, He wrote what He meant, and He meant what He wrote, right? So kind of like I said what I said in a minute type thing. So there's really only one interpretation for all of Scripture, now, there's varying degrees how we will uh, kind of disagree, and we can all point back to Scripture and show why, and we may never know all the right things there are to know about the, the Bible, and I will tell you truthfully, I don't think any of us will ever have it all together and all figured out. Some of this is just a mystery, but I do know that when God wrote it, He wrote it for a specific time, specific people, for a specific reason. So that's what we have to take into account, too, as we're shaping our doctrine, our theology, as we read through the Word of God, and we let it shape who we are and, and what we believe. It gives us instruction. 
Not just for doctrine, but instruction as well. It gives us instruction on things like how to handle false teaching, how to handle church discipline, how to handle many different things within the church, how to come to conclusions. It gives us instructions. It lights our path, right? So we see that through here is when you just need to read that's when you need to read the Bible and soak up what you're reading and study what you're reading and search for the true meaning of what God is saying because it's shaping who we are and what we believe. And that is very important if you don't know that already. What you believe matters. So in other words, I'm saying to you, theology matters, doctrine matters, because you could get way out in left field and be uh, believing some sort of heresy that's why it's important to have people in your life to sharpen you. Help me understand the Bible. Help me read the Bible. Help me with this. Uh, that's why there are good helps out there. Good commentaries out there. But always come back to the Scriptures. Um, another couple of Scriptures for that. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 4 and 5 says, When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets. I, I'm sorry, I went to the wrong side. i got to flip. I'm not used to flipping. We're on section 3. Anybody else like to just have it all in order? Or do you like flipping? Because sometimes I miss the flip. All right, the top of page two. Oh my goodness, i got to hurry. We believe and teach that the Scripture is sufficient, and with the guiding efforts of the Holy Spirit, it is entirely adequate for every spiritual or emotional need and is infinitely superior to all human understanding and wisdom. In other words, again, Scripture is enough. We don't have to go to the latest wisdom guru or the latest person that can tell us everything about our spiritual and emotional needs, we find that in the Word of God. I want to read, want to read a couple of these verses to you. Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Isn't that beautiful to know and understand that our thoughts are not His? His are not ours. His ways are not ours. We are different from God. In other words, we are not God. That's why we need the Bible. We really make bad gods. Really bad gods. We find ourselves in many areas of destruction simply because we try to overlook the Bible, overlook what He's already said, and try to do our own thing and live our own way when the Bible is teaching us and showing us this is what's going to light your path. This is what you need. This is going to shape your doctrine. This is going to give you instruction. This is going to give you wisdom. It's greater than all. Hum I don't understand why people go to psychics. Most of the time... They're always trying to sell something out front and there's nobody in the parking lots. Have y'all ever noticed that? Like when there's a sign saying that get your thing read here or whatever, they're trying to sell a car or something because business is bad. But people do go to these things. You see it in bigger cities all the time where people go to other people saying, tell me my future, tell me what's going to happen. Go to the Word. Go to the Bible. That is our instruction Scripture should be the standard for our life. Second, or not the second section, but the second section on page two. We believe and teach the clarity of Scripture and its re relevance to the world today. It is consistent within itself and is properly interpreted in the literal, grammatical, historical sense. Scripture is the completed revelation of God and nothing shall be added to it or taken from it. And right here, Deuteronomy 4.2, you shall not add to the word of God that I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you. And over on page 3, the one I went to earlier, Ephesians 3, 4, and 5, when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations. It is, has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. 
Jude 1, 3. Beloved, I, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. And then Revelation 22, 18 and 19 says, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words, the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are, the descri which are described in this book. Simply put this morning, and I don't have time to get into the canon of Scripture. I would love for you to research that on your own. But when it comes to the Bible, there are 66 books that we talked about earlier. 39 Old Testament, 27 New Testament. Do not add or take away from this book. The Bible itself gives us stern warning because if we start to add to the Bible something that's not already in there, what have we done then? We're starting to make ourselves God again, like we know all things, that we can do all things, that we're bringing something new to the table when Scripture itself teaches us what? There is nothing new under the sun. So for us to bring some new revelation or new prophecy is, is, is not right. It's false because the Bible teaches us clearly, even in these Scriptures, that the Word was delivered to the saints once and for all through prophets through the writing of men uh, being inspired by the Holy Spirit. And we have everything that we need from now until Jesus comes back. There's nothing new that we're going to learn about the church. There's nothing new that we're going to learn about salvation. There's nothing new that we're going to learn about the character and attributes of God. There's nothing new that we're going to learn about anything. So we can't add to. And then, if we start taking away, we find ourselves in error as well. We find ourselves being sinful because we cannot take away from what God has already said. I see sometimes where most of you have probably seen this. It's the meme on uh, the circling around social media that says how a lot of Christians read uh, Matthew 7 and it says, Judge not. And then the, in Sharpie, the whole rest of the chapter's removed pretty much. That is, in my opinion, taking away from what God says. So we see that people want to cut and paste when it comes to the Bible. And we can't cut and paste the Bible. We have to let the Bible interpret the Bible, interpret the Bible, so we can come to a firm understanding of the Bible. And some of you may say, the Bible is hard to read. And I would say, you are absolutely right. <laughs> there are times where it is so hard, you get bogged down into numbers. You get like Leviticus, it gets really weird. You're like, what is, what is happening here? But when you start studying those things out and understanding the Levitical law and, and all of these things and what happens all throughout Scripture, how it all ties in together, then you'll start to say, oh, I see, I get it. And it's one of those most eye-opening experiences when you start to see how Leviticus relates to Matthew. But it just takes studying, it takes time, it takes putting down our phones, putting down our TV remotes, putting down the, the music, doing whatever we have to do to get alone somewhere and open the Word and study it carefully. Because it matters how you study the Bible. And we've already gone through this, that we don't want to come to some uh, her heretical view that God's not clearly teaching. So when it gets hard, it's always good to be able to uh, go to somebody. I want to encourage you, if you're not reading and studying the Bible, if you think it's hard... Ask somebody, how can I do this better? How can I study better? How can I, what can I do to help this? I like to say, uh, sometimes when people start to want to really get into the Word and study the Word, they'll, they'll do good until they get to Leviticus numbers, some of those crazy places, and it just kind of gets heavy and bogged down. And I like to say, hold up, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. We don't have to get large swatches of study in. Some people can. Jeremiah studies like I don't know what and retains it so well. He could study for eight hours in a room by himself and know it all. But I'm not like that. So there's times when I'm studying, I take bites at a time. Then I have to get up and walk away from it. Refresh, get whew, recharge, come back to it and get into good study and then go back and forth. That may be you. Some of you may, get to, may need to go through one uh, book of the Bible slowly so you can learn it. The goal is not just to read for reading's sake. The goal is to learn it, to know it, to understand it. And that takes time. But here's the kicker. When you learn it and you understand it, 
We have to be obedient to it. We've talked about this before. We can't just be knowledgeable about the Word and not be obedient. Right? Obedience will show that we serve and love Christ. So take the time to do hard things. This is going to sound silly, but isn't it easy to do easy things? And hard to do hard things? It's easy to take the easy way out, but sometimes it's not as beneficial for you, is it? It's easy. I'll just put it in ways that all of you can understand, hopefully. I do. It's easier to eat a zebra cake than some cucumbers. I would much rather, it's just, it tastes so good, it's got a good texture, you can have it with a glass of milk, it goes down well. A cucumber. But cucumbers are green, <laughs> they're vegetables, huh? They do taste good. But in my mind, it's so much easier just to go for the zebra cake. It's already packaged. You've got to take a cucumber and clean it off. You've got to cut it up. A lot of work. But isn't it more beneficial for you to eat cucumbers rather than zebra cakes? <laughs> okay, for those of you that don't know, it is more beneficial for you to eat a cucumber than a zebra cake. How did we get here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I took you there. Sorry. It is more beneficial for you to do the hard things of studying Scripture than it is to just pop on a YouTube video or just take my word for it every Sunday. I don't want you just to take my word for it every Sunday. I want you to go test my study. And I want you to come back and say, I don't know. I think you may have missed it here. And then we'll sit down and we'll look where I missed it. And then I may say, I missed it. Thank you. I want to encourage you to study the Bible. It's hard, but it's beneficial. Just think, every time you open it, I need to be eating cucumbers now. <laughs> Eat cucumbers while you're reading and studying the Bible. It'll help you all the way around, spiritual and physical. You're getting it all done there. So, what's that? Pickles are cucumbers, so technically, right? Well, yeah, I know, but... See, we try to justify everything. It's easier to eat a pickle, but still green and cucumberish, right? But also know this. I want, to be, I want to be real with you this morning because I love you. That's the only way. I've heard it said like this before. The Bible is not about you. <laughs> the, I said, the Bible is not about you, Ben. <laughs> ben was back there like, what? The Bible's not about us. It's about God and His redemptive plan for man. And that's only through the shed blood of Jesus on the cross, the death and the burial and the resurrection. So every time that we read Scripture, we shouldn't read us into it, but we should read God into it. Now, are there things for us? Absolutely. This is beneficial for us, for training, for reproof, for rebuke, right? All of these things that the Word teaches, but even then, it's about God. It is not about us. I see so many people, so many young people today too, is like, God is for me. I'm, it's all about me from here on out. I'm going to live my life. No, you live the life that God has called you to live. It may mean suffer. It may mean heartache. It may mean pain. But we can't walk around inserting ourselves into Scripture because that is dangerous. Let me give you an example before I give this book away and we close with some fellowship time before service. The story of David and Goliath. I'll just do it like this really quickly. You're not David in that story. David is David in that story. Goliath is not your problems, your everything that you got, like 99 problems, but Goliath ain't one kind of thing, right? It's like Goliath is not the problems of your life. So we don't insert like, I just need to faithfully sling my stone and I'm going to slay these giants. You know what? You can throw a stone as far as you can, but those problems will still be there tomorrow. 
And if those aren't, there will be new ones. Y'all have lived long enough to know this, right? And for you kids, I hope I'm not dampening your party like, oh man, life sounds like it gets harder. It does, but it's also beautiful as we trust in Christ and we read the Bible through the sovereignty of God lens and not the crummy God of man lens, right? So keep that in mind as you read. What is God saying to his people at this time? And what is he saying to us today? Not what I think, not what I uh, think it means to me, but what is God saying? Now, that was a really quick run through of that. There's a ton more scripture verses for you on that page. I would encourage you to keep this. You're going to get, if any of you want to do a three ring punch hole thing, what are they called? Three ring binder and you can put holes in it. You can keep this because you're going to get something like this every week for notes and some references in here. And... uh, you just keep that. So each week, these guys are going to get up and have this kind of uh, line, uh, what's it called, outline to go by. So it'd be good for you to keep notes and, and those things. But you'll see each week, on here, it's page three, right at the bottom, there is one, two, three, four, five different uh, other further studies, further books that you can purchase. Now this morning, how many people like reading? Got some folks that like to read. How many of you would love to read a book if you got it for free? Hmm. Why do I have to be the first one here to do this? Like, how should we give this away? Somebody help me out. Help me out, Miss Brenda. How should we give this away? Rock, paper, scissors. (laughs) Everybody stand up. Let's go. (laughs) You got any thoughts, Miss Brenda? Should I just do it like we're at a wedding? I just turn around and... <laughs> Boom! Excellent idea. Arm wrestle. All right. Uh, who doesn't want the book? Like, who's going who's gonna to raise... You don't want the book? Okay, come up here, Ben. <laughs> come here. You can have the book. No, I'm just kidding. I just want to, hey, come here, Ben. Ben, come here. You tell me when to stop. Even if it's a tie. Okay. For those that would love the book, we'll start over here. If anybody wants to, anybody that wants the book, say a number. Okay, let me tell you, it's between 1 and 207. This is Scripture Alone, the Evangelical Doctrine by R.C. Sproul. 207. 1 to 207. So I'm going to start on this side of the room. Somebody throw out a number that wants it. I heard 26, 180, 118, 87, 94. 78. <laughs> All right. Now this side. 50. 173, 140. 100. 11. What's that? 25. 32. 57. 45, I don't think so, anybody else, two, Two. all right, I'm going to let Ben say the number, which makes Brother Will Harold closest at 32, right, without going over, the closest without going over, yep, so, brother, this is your new book, that you, uh, you can come back and give us a book report on it one day at the end of all this. Tell us what was good and what you do, agreed and disagreed with. Because if you read a book, it is good to read a book and have things you agree with and things you disagree with. So don't just read a book thinking, oh, yeah, I'm going to agree with everything in here because you likely will not. So keep that in mind, huh? Unless it's the Bible. <laughs> you should agree with everything in the Bible. All right. It is about 941 we were planning on stopping every Sunday at 9.45 to give time for bathroom, coffee, fellowship with one another, 
uh, welcoming one another. So let me pray, and then we'll get into that. Father, thank you so much for this time as we talked about your word, and we are thankful that it is true, that it is sufficient, that it is error-free, that it's trustworthy. And Father, we are so thankful that we can read it and know that it's your words written, and uh, we can take from that instruction and reproof and rebuke. And we know that Hebrews 4.12 teaches us that it's like a two-edged sword that penetrates deep. So, Father, I pray that it would, it would expose us, show us our places and areas that we need to repent and be reconciled back to you, and maybe even to one another. Father, we are just thankful again for this time together. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.